<laughs> Hallelujah. Woo. Praise God. Good morning, church. We're glad you're here. We're glad you're ready to celebrate. Some of you at first were like, well, okay, we're doing this. All right. <laughs> By the end, we're like, yeah, let's celebrate Jesus. Hallelujah. We believe he's risen, right? Amen. That's the best news you're going to hear all week, just saying. In case, you know, you're wondering, yeah, God is so good. And we just want to put our whole life circumstances in the context of the greatness of who God is. And that should give us pause. And it doesn't always because we're busy and we're distracted and we're focused on other things. But right now, we're just going to invite the Lord to just invade our busyness, invade our to-do list, invade our stuff. And we're going to exalt yeah. him. We're going to glorify him. And when we lift him up. He will draw us to him. That's what he promises. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we celebrate Jesus yes, Christ this Jesus. morning. We celebrate salvation. We celebrate your resurrection, Jesus. It wasn't just about Good Friday dying for our sins. It was also Easter Sunday where you rose from the dead and beat sin and death, Lord. And you've given us that promise too, Lord, that our sins are washed away, that we're healed, restored, forgiven. And also, Lord, that today we can connect with you by the power of your Holy Spirit, your manifest presence here in this room and online, Lord, wherever we are. God, we just choose to step into that time and place right now where we are open to receive from you. We're open to exalt you and give you praise yes. to the highest place where you deserve to be. Amen. And Lord, we just submit everything else, every worry we submit under you and the celebration yes, of you. you. Every concern we, we submit and put it under you. We lay it at the altar. Every hope we have for something that's coming up, we're waiting to hear about. We give it to you, Lord, and we trust you for the results. Lord, for our very well-being right now, in this room, in this place, wherever we're connecting within the sound of my voice, Lord, that we trust that you are going ahead of us, Lord. And so we submit all those things, and we seek first the kingdom of God. We seek his righteousness. We seek you, Lord God, and for you to do what you want in us, Lord. We submit, we surrender, we say, okay, God, we trust you today. We celebrate you and thank you for who you are, God. Move in us, we ask, in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen, amen, amen. come on.
Father, you are the answer to everything, Lord. We find our satisfaction in you. We find our completion in you, O oh God. Thank you, Jesus. For you answer our every need, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. We seek you today, Lord. We seek your kingdom and all your righteousness, Lord God. We put you, Lord, on the throne and pedestal of our hearts and our minds and our lives, Lord God. Take control, Lord God. Be in control, Father, of every circumstance, Lord, of every aspect in our lives, Lord. Hallelujah. It lowers us to raise us so we can sing his praises, whatever is his way. He makes us rich and poor that we might trust him, that we might trust him more. Whatever is his way, all is well. Whatever is his way. 
your love today, Lord God. Praise you, Lord Jesus. We sing of your goodness, Lord, and your mercy, Father, for taking us out of the darkness, Lord, into your light, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for the power of salvation, Lord, that now we are able to live in freedom, Lord, to worship you, Lord God. Thank you, Jesus. to be darkness without you I live my life in blindness but now I'm found and now sing sing For all 
for all that we are, we give you praise. For all that we're not, but that we know you're still working on, we give you praise. For the promises found in your scriptures, your holy word, we give you praise. We honor and glorify you, God. We recognize who you are today again. And because your mercies are new every morning, your breath is fresh, your gift is every breath we draw, we can discover brand new things about the depth of your love, the power of your peace, the deliverance through your mighty name, Lord Jesus. You are able to restore anything. Anything. The prodigal son thought he was too far away. The nation was stood up against a mighty sea and wondered, is this the end? Is this it? Is this the best we can do in our being set free? But God was not finished. And he received the son and he made a way where there was no way. This morning he speaks over us to say that's that's who I am, still longing to be that in your life today. You glorify me, you exalt me, let me come in and lift every burden and restore every joy. Behold, I make all things new. I want you to declare that out loud so your, your ears can hear it coming out of your own mouth. You're going to testify this morning. God says, behold, I make all things new. Now think about your stuff right now and declare with me. The Lord says, behold, I make all things new. Praise you, Lord. All things new. You are more than able, God. We love you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for your, your work on the cross, your resurrection, your power. You're breathing out the Holy Spirit promises of your word that never end. You're never finished with us until we stand face to face and then we reign with you for a thousand years and we see you establish a new heaven and a new earth. All those things in scripture that include us, Lord. Help us see beyond this day, this week, this month, this year. And help us see you, the God of yesterday, today and forever who never leaves us, never forsakes us who loves us more than we can understand, how deep, how wide, how far, how vast. Hallelujah. We love you, Jesus. We worship you in Jesus' name. And all God's people say, amen. 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 You may be seated. Oh, good morning, good morning. I'm not stuttering. I just say things twice because I really mean them. Good morning. <laughs> there you are. Uh, I have a few announcements this morning to bring to your attention, but I'm just so glad you guys are here today, and I'm glad for those of you who could join us online. My name is Pastor Steve. Everyone here is like, yeah, we know, but just for anyone who's checking in today, um, we heard from Trinidad this morning. It's awesome. God bless you, Bethel Board Nav. Uh, in Trinidad and other places in the world that are connecting with us, we're grateful. But also, though, we recognize that, that the, what we do in here makes a difference out there on the streets here and on our city, on our province, on our, on our country, right? Yeah. Okay, good. You're with me. That's good. Right. So we, we just said we have some new neighbors, by the way, and they've moved in a couple things and praying for them already. Christmas is a great excuse to bump into them with my annual cookie drive. Uh, we, uh, we touch all the properties that touch ours or right next to us. We, uh, we just do, do a little delivery and wish them a Merry Christmas. That's our tradition to them. They can believe whatever they want. But from us, Merry Christmas. God bless you. And by the way, our services are, you know, <laughs> speaking of services, we have a Christmas Eve service on a Friday, one hour Christmas Eve candlelight service from 7 o'clock. Promise you by 7.59, we're off to family and whatever else, but we're going to spend some time focusing on Jesus, and of course, it is a time with family. We, we do want to renew our fervor in making sure we're, we're keeping masks on and, and hand sanitizing and distancing in our services. We've been really great at that, and uh, 
even while the numbers have gone up, we're just going to keep doing what we're doing because it's working. And we're going to continue, not in fear, but just to continue to pray for health and protection and blessing. Even as we come into this Christmas time, there's a few extra things we want to do. Christmas Eve service is one of them. Also, um, we're going to have kids ministry start December 5th. Woo! So leading up, that's next week already. We're getting back to, to Super Kids. They're going to be in for worship. Then during announcements, we're going to pray over them and bless them. And you know, if nothing else, what an opportunity to speak a word of blessing, a word of favor over our kids. We haven't been doing that for way too long and just doing it privately. We want them to know publicly that we are madly in love with them. We think they've got great potential and that God's already doing things by His Holy Spirit in their life, shaping them and empowering them. Amen? So that being said, following today's service, if you are in, involved with kids, signed up to be involved with kids or would like to be involved with kids ministry, uh, hopefully you've already had a chance to speak with Rochelle, but if not, that's who we connect with, Mr. Rochelle over here. Great following service. We're going to have a, a bit of a workshop to walk through and prep so that we hit the ground running next Sunday. So if that is you, please hang out after church and uh, we will get started with that as soon as possible. Also tomorrow night we have a board meeting, 6.30 here. And uh, we're also wanting to do a Christmas movie. We haven't been able to have a Christmas banquet uh, because of COVID. And we, uh, last year we actually went to, we took to the cinemas for a movie. Um, so this year we're going to do it right in-house, December 12th. So Sunday morning church, Sunday night, we've got a Christmas movie. And uh, you can bring your own popcorn that's allowed. You just have to pick up any that, some of you are a single popcorn eater. Some of you are a handful popcorn eater. I don't know who you are. But the handful of popcorn eaters, you're just going to have to watch. If it overflows, your cup is overflowing, just pick up your popcorn. That's all, you know. Because, you know, you be I believe in church mice. <laughs> and we don't want church mice, so just that being said. All right. Um, Christmas Eve, Christmas movie, uh, Super Kids starting up, board meeting. I think I've got everything. There is something else. You'll notice at the back that there is a petition. It's a petition to the House of Commons because they are trying to change uh, the representation of charitable status. It started a few years ago with changing the definition of having camp, summer camp, or kids staff uh, at a church that they must hold to certain things about uh, the unborn child, about life, and about abortion. And they're back in, con uh, in session again in the House of Commons trying to suggest that we have dishonest practices by explaining that abstinence still works and that abortion is only one of the options, and that there are a lot of other options, especially the ones based on the Word of God. And so uh, this is from um, a Parliament member, I think from Saskatchewan, actually, who started this, but it's a petition to sign, and I'll read this quickly. It says, whereas the Liberal Party of Canada has promised in its 2021 platform to deny the charitable status of organizations that have convictions about abortion, which the Liberal Party views as dishonest, and whereas this may jeopardize the charitable status of hospitals, houses of worship, schools, homeless shelters, and other charitable organizations, we do not agree with that party on this matter for reasons of conscience. Whereas many Canadians depend upon and benefit from the charitable work done by such organizations, whereas the government has previously used a values test to discriminate against worthy applicants of the Canadian Summer Jobs Program, denying funding for an organization which was not willing to check a box endorsing political positions of the governing party, Whereas charities and other nonprofit organizations should not be discriminated against on the basis of their political views or religious views, values, should not be subject to politicized values tests. Whereas all Canadians have the right to under the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms express, have expression without discrimination. Therefore, we the undersigned citizens and residents of Canada call upon the House of Commons to, one, protect and preserve the application of the charitable status rules on a politically and ideologically neutral basis without discrimination on the basis of political or religious values and without the imposition of another values test. And number two, affirm the right of Canadians to the freedom of expression. Now, I'm not a political guy from behind here. I just want the church to allow, be allowed to be the church. All right? And I don't care what color you put on your front lawn when it comes time to vote. That's not what this is about. But as a charitable organization, as a religious organization, as an organization that holds to what we feel is the standard of Scripture for us, that we would maintain what we believe. And so if you feel like that's something you want to get behind, we do have um, a petition at the back. There's only five on a page because we want you to have the full thing in front of you when you sign it, not just, oh, yeah, that, that thing, and then just go to page three or whatever and sign your name. So that is a matter of conscience for each of you to decide what to do with, but we made it available in the foyer, and we will mail those to this member of parliament. It was on the back of the original, but 
Anyway, you can uh, sign it if you'd like, but I want you to know it was available. We just continue to want to be the church, and, and we want to make sure that we are doing everything God is calling us to. And that means we need to reach a, a broken and fallen world who don't understand where we stand or why we stand there. And so we need to start with respect, we need to start with love and grace, but also we need to continue to, to fight for love and grace for, for our, our unborn children as well. So that is my message on that. Also just remind you of giving. We don't actually give um, by, by passing the plate. Uh, I didn't stop there. We, we don't give. Yes, no, yes, we give. <laughs> we still build the ministry. We want to we wanna equip the kingdom to, for God to do what he wants to do, and it, it does take the money. There's nothing wrong with asking about giving a tithe and offering because I'm not asking you to give me money. I'm not saying I want your money. I just want you to follow what Scripture says. We give a tithe, a 10%, in order to be in obedience. And we sow an offering to, for seeds of blessing, and we pray that God will multiply that seed because he can do that. So this is for, yeah, keeping the lights on here, local missions, missions around here, and also literally missions around the world. And we're praying for, for people like in the Philippines, the honest hands that we have with the ceilings. We have the Williams and we, uh, in Spain, I think it is. And we have uh, the, the children's home in Africa. And we have Chuck Price, who is finally starting to travel again shortly in the new year and uh, continuing to do coats and boots and, and blankets and stuff in downtown areas. He's connected with other ministries that are doing street ministry and literally bringing aid to them because people at churches, no reapers in the rain, they drop all kinds of stuff off like they do their spring cleaning and goes, here's a bag, and they drop in front of them. He actually makes sure that gets into to different people's hands who need it. So we continue to support all of those. And so you can give here at the box at the back during the week. There's a black mailbox at the front. We check it daily. If you're online, you can go to our website, top right corner, click on Canada Helps. And you can give that way. They issue you uh, their very own receipt for you to do that. But it's a way for you to continue to support us. And we thank you for those gifts too. So Lord, uh, for our blessing, for our offering, for our, our tithe, we ask God for you to bless it. And we ask you to put it in the right hands, the right ministries, for the right opportunities to build your kingdom, that your kingdom would come and your will would be done. Bless this, Lord, we pray. And Lord, I pray also that you would help us have a voice in Canada, not to take over and tell everyone what to do, but that we would have the room to be who you have called us to be according to your word and in Jesus' name. We thank you for your great love for us and for what you want to do even in us this morning. We praise you. We glorify your name. In Jesus' name we, we ask. Amen. Amen. I need to get hydrated for this message because this message is called Fit or Fitness. There we go. Fitness. So... Yeah, I'm working it up. Is anyone cold in here? I, I, I come in here and I'm like, it is so hot. But that's because I'm just on the go. So <laughs> There we go. Yeah, ta-da! That's it. I'm here all week. It's all right. Uh, being fit is something that North Americans are actually uh, crazy about. It's actually a multi-billion dollar ministry. Or ministry. It's a multi... Wouldn't that be nice? I'm in the Ministry of Fitness. Thank you very much. No. It's a multi-million dollar, billion dollar industry, and people are caught up with uh, their self, the way they look, the way they feel, their self, you know, what's my vibe out there, what do people see me as, and we look in the mirror and go, oh, certainly it's not like that, right? We're very conscious of, of how fit we are on the outside, unfortunately, but the most important thing we need to recognize is that God wants to do something not just on the outside, but also on the inside, and I want to talk about what we have and who's giving it. Uh, because you can go on this diet or that diet, you can eat certain things, you can do certain kind of workout. Well, I use those bell weights and I throw them around. Well, I have used the medicine ball. Well, unless you're using free weights, you're not doing the right thing because the balance is really important to build symmetry and all that. I've got symmetry. I keep my bubble in the middle. That's how I do it. It's, that helps me stay in balance. So. But God wants to do a work inside us to build up our spirit and to make sure that we are spiritually fit that we are in the right place before God. And so uh, we recognize we have it because he gave it. And he gave it because of who he is, not who we are. Not how fit we are, not what kind of running shoes we have, not what kind of, you know, slim, whatever, fashionable, you know, workout attire you might have for the gym. But that God wants to do a work deep inside of us that will then come flowing out of us. It's kind of like the diet. If I choose to eat right, then eventually it begins to show on the outside. You know, I can't eat a piece of celery one day and go, how am I now? Step on that scale. First of all, I don't eat celery because it's a waste of calories. Because all you do, 
But secondly, eating one piece of salary is not going to do it, friends. We, we need to continue to do what it takes to get fit, right? No pain, no gain. That means it also means we have to do what it takes to get fit spiritually. We still need to go into the Word. And, you know, I've talked to some new believers or believers who are coming back to the church, and you're like, so did you read the Bible this week? We talked about your reading. Have you read the Bible? Did you read any of the Bible? Did you get any verses in there? Did you read stuff? And I just I didn't really feel moved or motivated, you know. And our friend Chuck Bryce, Reverend Chuck Bryce was here yesterday. He used to tell me when I was on staff with him, he says, if you want to feel led, jab yourself with a pencil. Says, <laughs> like, some of you are like, oh, okay, I get it. We don't always feel like you're following spiritual disciplines, right? And I can tell you that you won't feel like reading the Word until you read the Word. And as you read the Word, it's alive. It's a living, active thing. And as you read it, you go, oh, I needed that. Oh, I didn't remember that. I've read this a hundred times before. But right now, that means something more to me because it's this living, active thing that's able to instruct me and inform who I am. But it's a discipline. I had to read it first for it to start feeding me. I can't just go, you know what? I, as a pastor, I own, I think, 13 Bibles, different, you know, different sort of uh, stylization. Some are red letter, some are hardcover, some have the, the tabs and stuff. Some of them have the two different kinds in it. You can read it at the same time. Now I do that on Bible Gateway. But, you know, none of those books can help me. Unless I open them up. I know where to go, BibleGateway.com. I could say, hey, everybody, I know the Bible because I know BibleGateway.com. No, 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 you got to go there, read the Scripture, get it into you, and then it will begin. I, I can buy celery all day long. I can buy spinach and lettuce and, uh, you know, not buy chips and Doritos and pop. And I can, but if I don't actually start getting it into me, it's not going to change how fit I am. The same thing is with praying. Hey, have you talked to God recently? Who? Right? Not just God is great, God is good, let us thank Him for our food. Amen. If that's your prayer as a young person, that's fine. But connect your heart with it. If you are meaningfully praying, God is great, God is so good, that, that's fine. But if it's just some routine thing that just kind of missed your heart, then slow down. Talk to God about where you are. If you're happy and you know it, don't clap your hands. Talk to God. If you're happy and you know it, talk to God. If you're sad and you know it, talk to God. If you are confused and you know it, or if you're confused and you don't know it, <laughs> what? Talk to God, right? So read the word. It will inform you. It will shape you. Talk to God, and you are going to sense. You might get a big, booming voice from the heavens. I don't know. I've never had that. Steve, take a left at the next. Like I haven't had, but I have felt leanings. I've felt, felt leading. And there's times when... I've heard, like, God, I think he wanted me to do something, and I was chicken, and I didn't do it. Have you ever had that? Come on, honesty time. You're in church now. Okay, yeah, yeah. God, God wanted me to do it. I'm like, ah, yeah, you know, I don't know. And then, and then he does it through someone else right in front of you. But that, I was, that was, I was going to, oh. there are other times when I get it right, and I'm very excited for those because I realize I, I felt what God was leading me to do. I did it, and it blessed somebody. You just have to have the courage to continue to exercise that spiritual gift of discernment. You need to, to exercise. You know what? There was a time when I, I worked at a, a conservative church. It was not charismatic. It was not Pentecostal. It was evangelical, but, but they were a lot more confused, like even more than us. Like, can you imagine? It's like, it's, it's very, very subdued. I've been to, swinging from the chandelier churches, I've been to very, you know, slow, quiet, when I stayed upon Jehovah. Um, and this is somewhere in between, but... I realized I hadn't been using my heavenly language. I hadn't been speaking in tongues. I hadn't been, you know, just going for it, interceding. And I'd like to think that I was so wise it just came to my attention like that. Honestly, what happened is I was praying one time with a friend of mine, and we just started digging into something. And I was like, you know, the, the issue was still hard. The issue was a tough thing he was dealing with. But as I started pushing in and saying, God, we have got to have a breakthrough. I need you to move. And and I just started speaking. I didn't know what I was speaking. I knew the Spirit of God was going to start working through this issue and we were going to have a breakthrough. And I'll tell you, I hadn't done it for so long and I was kind of like, wow, that was good. <laughs> I needed that, you know. And then I, I realized God was saying, you know, I need you to intercede right now because the days are getting short. Jesus is coming soon. I need you to get on your knees and dig in a little deeper. Oh, but it's not comfortable on my knees. Tell you what, I don't, I don't even like getting on my face, especially on this carpet. You know how many people walked in this carpet? 
But there are times when I get on my face on this carpet. I believe God to heal me from any germs or whatever I might pick up. You know, It's uncomfortable to be on your face. Try praying on your face. A lot of, a lot of uh, old monks, other, other uh, theologians, believers used to do that. And it's not comfortable, but you are focused, I'll tell you. Because you're not going to fall asleep with your nose flat on the carpet. You're not going to fall asleep on your knees because after a while, maybe it's not the getting down part, it's the getting back up again, right? Click, crick. I used to have one knee that clicked when I got up. Now both of them in stereo. <laughs> click. But we need to continue to practice those things. And sometimes we get away from them, not because we've, you know, turned away from God completely or decided to, you know, go blow up a building, but because we just are busy or we're just tired, or it just feels like the same old thing, you know, yeah, prayer, okay, reading the Bible, okay. Those disciplines are going to make us fit. So I want to take you to Colossians 1, 9 to 18, and this is by no way an exhaustive list of how to get fit, how to recognize what God has done in us, but it's a little snapshot that helps us. So Colossians 1, 9 to 18, let me read it. It says, for this reason we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you, and ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of His will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. All wisdom and understanding come from God. And His desires that you are filled with the knowledge of His will this morning. Verse 10. That you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing Him, being fruitful in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all might, according to His glorious power, for all patience and long suffering with joy giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in the light. He has delivered us from the power of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son of His love, in whom we have redemption through His blood and the forgiveness of sins. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by Him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things consist. He is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning of the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he may have the preeminence. Now, there's a whole lot of that in there to unpack. But when we recognize that you and I have a personal trainer, I know it doesn't show, but I have a personal trainer, the supreme, the preeminent Lord Jesus Christ. I go to God's gym. You guys have heard, maybe not Gold's gym. Okay. See, in Acts 17, 28, it says, for in him we live and move and have our being, which means in him we are either fit or unfit, but by his very existence of speaking the world into existence. We breathe because He gave us breath. We live because He gave us life. We're on this planet right here, right now for this, you know, 80 to 100 years or whatever because God has seen fit to allow us to be, period. And we question Him <laughs> like we know better. Anyways, let's just look at this short list. Because, what we have because of who gives it. We recognize that everything we have is in Jesus Christ. And John 15 talks about the vine and the branches. God's the gardener. Jesus is the vine. We are the branches. And apart from me, you can do nothing. Nada. Zip. Zero. Absolutely nothing. So to be fit, to be alive, and then to be fit, we have to be in Christ Jesus. So because it's Him giving it, it says, first of all, that we can be filled to walk worthy in a time where it is tough to walk worthy, in a time where the devil lies to us and, and challenges us of whether or not we are worthy. And we think in human standards whether or not I'm worthy. Well, let me say it as nicely as I can. Um, you need to get over yourself. Because apart from me, you can do nothing, Jesus says. And in him we live and move and have our being. So if I have anything good in me, guess what? It came from Jesus Christ you have anything good in you, no offense, as we Canadians say, sorry, but if you've done anything good, if you have anything good, if you are blessed in any way, it is because of the author and perfecter of your faith, Jesus Christ. 
And so he allows us to walk worthy. So many times I'm talking to people in counseling who goes, you know, I just think I've messed up too far. I've just done too much. I just, I just don't feel I'm worthy. And my answer to them is, you are right. Thank you. See you next week. No, none of us are worthy except through Jesus Christ, through his work on the cross. He was sinless. I'm not. He paid the price. I didn't. He offered the gift. I took it. And so because of him, I can be worthy. Filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. In all wisdom and spiritual understanding. I was afraid my words weren't going to fall flat today, but I'm praying that you get them by the power of the Holy Spirit. All wisdom, all spiritual wisdom and understanding. I'm not there yet. I don't know that any of you are there yet, but that we have this power through Jesus Christ to have all wisdom and all spiritual understanding. That's beautiful. That will help us walk worthy of the calling. Next thing is strengthen with all might. God, you're putting me through something. I just don't know if I'm strong enough. Same answer. You aren't. I don't care how much you can bench press, how many times. I don't care if you can lift a bus. If you are fighting spiritual battles, the scripture says the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. They're not fleshly. They're not about the size of your bicep. Okay? But they are mighty through God. So our strength is comes from God. Our worthiness comes from Jesus Christ. Our strength, it says, with all might, that we would have all might. You have all might in Jesus' name through the strength of what he offers us. Filled to walk worthy, strengthened with all might. And this is beautiful. He has qualified us. Qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in the light. That means wholeness. That means forgiveness. That means redemption bought back. That means we have a future, not our future, but God's future. That means the hope of heaven. That means we reign with him for an eternity. That's what we have in being qualified. You are now a son or daughter of the Most High God. You are now a prince or princess in the kingdom of heaven. You're like, okay, yeah, yeah, bumper sticker, T-shirt, I've heard all that. If you get what royalty looks like on earth, imagine this is not royalty on earth. This is royalty in heaven. That is a whole other level, royalty in the kingdom of God. He's our king. He's our father. That's the other beautiful thing is that he is, is a father, and he's delivered us into this inheritance. He delivered us from darkness, from our weakness, from our misgivings, our sin, our distraction, our destruction, and he has delivered us into light and life and an inheritance. Peter says it can never perish, spoil, or fade. It is how salvation will never lose its strength. Delivered us, one, from darkness, two, into the kingdom, three, into redemption, and four, into forgiveness. That's verse 13. He's delivered us from the power of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son of His love, in whom we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins. And so we have it because Jesus gave it, and Jesus gave it because of who He is. There is no one else on heaven or in earth or under the earth who could give us the list I just gave to you. I would love to give it to you, I love you guys. My heart is for you. I would love to bless you with all of that stuff. But it's not me. I can't do that. I can't pull you across the line any more than I can save you. I can tell you about salvation. But you ask Jesus into your heart as the one who died for your sins. To ask for forgiveness. To ask him to be your savior. You ask him to allow you to, be, to let him be the Lord of your life. And then you try to pursue him. I can't do that for you tell you all about it, I can tell you about my journey, I can tell you about what it's supposed to look like, but you have to say, yes, Lord, I want to be fit in the kingdom of God. I want to be qualified. I want to be delivered. That's our option. Let's look at verse 15. He does it because of who he is. He is our physical image of God, representing the Trinity. 
So there's this invisible God, this big guy in the sky that people cannot connect to, right? In fact, since the tent of meeting where, where it says Moses would meet with God and speak to him as a man speaks face to face. And then he's, God says, you know what? You are a stiff-necked people. I can't keep doing this because I can't be holy and still walk with you guys who are unholy. And that Old Testament was setting up the obvious um, thing about who we were as human beings in a, born in a sin nature, that we were never going to attain the glory of God or the perfection of His law. And until he spelled out the law, Paul says, you know, the more I knew the law, the more de- sin was birthed in me because I knew what was wrong. God needed to set that up because you wouldn't understand the wonder and power of someone dying on the cross, an execution that hundreds of people had, had been through, but this man particularly was different. To understand the separation of man and God was way more than just the Garden of Eden. It was who we were down to the core of who we are. You ask a, a beautiful little child, and you, you look at them and you say, how can that beautiful little child have a sin nature? Just put a box of Oreos on the top of the fridge and watch those guys learn how to climb. No, you can't have a cookie. Okay. I'm not having a cookie. I, I saw one little kid who was taught that they weren't allowed to touch something, and this is what they did. They came into the room. All the adults stopped talking. They're watching this little kid, you know, walk in, and he sees the, the adult food. You've had your snack. This is adult food. You're not allowed to touch it. You go off and play. you got some friends. you got toys. He went like this. No! No touch! No touch! <laughs> and we're watching him like, you know we see you, right? <laughs> like, no! No, he thought he was going to get out of the room. <laughs> like, okay, well, you're busted, kid. Smart enough. We have a sin nature. We are prone to do what we want to do in the flesh. And God says, I have something better for you. So we have this separation between this invisible God because He's holy and us in the flesh who are, well, in the flesh, right? And he had to make a way, and so Jesus came not only to to reveal the invisible God, but to reveal the nature of the invisible God. Am I holy? Absolutely. Is the Son of God without sin? Absolutely. Not one sin. And yet, because he sacrificed himself, forget the animals that would cover last Friday night's sin. I'm talking about every sin that came before, every sin that came during, and every sin that came after Jesus Christ was worthy to atone for those by His death on the cross and His resurrection. And so for us to know God was to see Jesus Christ be perfect and holy, because that's our Old Testament God, right? Holy and you're not. Bam! Thunder and lightning. But also you're my creation, and when I created you, I said, it is good. I love you. I want a relationship with you. And so because you broke the holiness, I didn't. I'm God, I'm never changing, same yesterday, today, and forever. But you were in the flesh, you listened to the serpent, you ate the fruit, you have a sin nature now, but I still love you like crazy. You're not doing what I asked you to do. You're not doing, it, doing things the way I expected you to. But I still love you because I'm your father. And I'm going to make a way to relate to you because I love you so much. And he had to sacrifice his son so that we could be the sons and daughters of Almighty God. He was the visible reflection of an invisible God, and He re- represented the Holy Spirit. In fact, I have trouble with some, some uh, religions that, that want to separate uh, God. They, they, their Jesus-only movement is, is actually, they say they're Christians, but they believe that there's only one God, and He's in the form of Jesus. And there's some who, who believe in the, in the Trinity that they're each separate gods, or they all have a hierarchy, or they're different people. And then I take them to the beginning of the Gospels where Jesus is getting baptized. And Jesus, God is not a multi-personality person, and he doesn't talk to himself. And so he's, Jesus himself is in the water with John the Baptist, saying, I need to do this to fulfill all righteousness. And then from the heavens, there is a voice saying, this is my son, in whom I am proud of. Listen, listen to him. And then... From the heavens, down comes the Holy Spirit in the form of a dove. Rests over Jesus. So if we're talking singularly about the Trinity, at some point, this being in the water, either he was a ventriloquist or had to somehow flash up into the heavens, 
and speak and then flash right back down into the water without causing a splash. And then becoming a bird or look what looked like a bird and light down over top of Jesus again. Woo, that was a baptism. I need a nap now. We believe in the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Because that's what the Word of God tells us. But we cannot see the Spirit. They talk about Spirit translating like breath or wind. And so we cannot see the wind, but we can see the effects of the wind. That's exactly why when I say, Lord, reveal your manifest presence here, you hear me saying that, manifest, manifest. What is this problem with this word manifest? It's because if you have Jesus in your heart, you know what you really have? You have the deposit of the Holy Spirit in your heart. And I don't mean the, the muscle that's, you know, just left of center beating in your... I'm talking about in your spirit, your soul, okay? You have a deposit of the Holy Spirit. So when we say, come, Holy Spirit, some people are like, he's already here, people, what, you know? And he is. And then we talk about the baptism and the filling of the Holy Spirit, that there is another event where Holy Spirit is moving in us. But wait a second, wasn't he already here? Yes, he's here, and he fills, he baptizes, and we can ask his manifest presence. So when I'm saying, Lord, move in our midst, we're not saying he's not already here. We're not even saying he can't move without our permission. I mean, that's kind of funny. He spoke us into existence, not the other way around. But we ask him to move. And so we, we want this invisible God to reveal himself, and he does, he does, he does. He did it in Jesus Christ. The firstborn over all creation through him and for him to show his supremacy. In him we live and move and have our being. If that isn't supreme, I don't know what is. In heaven and on earth, in the visible and the invisible, whether thrones, I like this, whether thrones or dominions, so he's talking about governments and rulers, right? And then whether principalities or powers, you know, Ephesians 6 talks very clearly about rulers and principalities, that there are spiritual forces that are given certain jurisdiction where they are allowed to operate. And sometimes they're allowed to operate there because people have let them come in. People have brought them in with some of the stuff they've been involved in. That sometimes we need to renounce those things and get delivered, get clear from spiritual forces that we've given permission to be in our home or in our school or at our workplace or in certain relationships that we have that we shouldn't have or that need to change. And then it says, in all things. Earth, on heaven and earth, visible, invisible, thrones or dominions, principalities or powers, because greater is he who is in me than he that is in the world. Right? And through Christ we are more than conquerors. Does that match up with this? Absolutely. It says also his supremacy, it says, in all things things. And then verse 18, he is the head of the body of Christ. Jesus is the head of the body of Christ. That's why he can offer us uh, being filled to walk worthy, being strengthened with all might, to be qualified, to be delivered from darkness into the kingdom, into redemption and forgiveness. Because he's the head of the church. He's head of the body of Christ here. He is the head of God's representation here on earth still to this very day. Even though he sits at the right hand of the Father, we are his body. First one, to the, first one to cross from death to life. First one. To life through his own resurrection. He is preeminent. That means surpassing all others. The one and only Savior. The one and only Deliverer. The one and only Sanctifier. The one and only Baptizer. And the soon coming King. Now if you go towards your ordination and you describe these things, you actually learn like a pages of scripture and, and ideology, theology, about the roles he plays, but we know that there's only one Savior. In a world that says, you know, you just believe whatever and that's good for you, well, we, we have respect enough as a human being made in the image of God, they're allowed to believe what they believe. But according to Scripture, there's only one way. There's still only one right answer in a, in a very, um, what, what's that word, not duplicitous, but in a world where everything goes, where everyone can have their own thing, there's still a right and wrong. And I still liken it to what I've said before. We can believe in gravity or we cannot believe in gravity. And as a person made in the image of God, fearfully and wonderfully made, God loves them, they're blessed. But if they don't believe in gravity, they're going to have the consequences of not believing in gravity. It might hurt. Just saying. When God says, 
I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. God loves us enough to believe that or not believe that. But we who know that Jesus is the only way, we who know that I was a sinner and now I'm saved, that I was inbound and now I'm delivered, that I needed peace and I have peace, that I have joy, that I have promise, that I have the Holy Spirit manifesting in me and around me. Have you ever felt like that? It is incredible. The Almighty God who's been here forever and will be here forever, who is watching over billions of lives, all of a sudden does something and you feel His power. Wasn't he busy doing something else in China or Russia? Wasn't he helping the people in B.C. get out of their flood? Wasn't he, wasn't he busy? And yet he stopped and he moved in your life. Wow. Like, thank you, God. Just kind of doesn't, you know, oh, yeah, gee, thanks, God. It doesn't, it doesn't even measure what God has done in my life. And I don't, yeah, I don't know. I won't speak for you. I'll speak for me. I wouldn't be alive if it wasn't for him. I wouldn't be in a good place if it wasn't for him. I couldn't walk through valleys by myself. I don't know how people who walk through death and tragedy and don't have Jesus, how they do it. I do not know. Because I have been in places like that where I have seen. Especially when I've looked back, but even in those moments when I'm in it, I have seen God take me through something. And I used to say this a lot, I haven't in a while, but I, I believe God doesn't often pull us out of situations. As a faithful God, He always pulls us through them. And he will spin things. He will make things work out for his good according to, to good for those who love him and are called according to his purpose. Romans 8, 28. It sounds like a bumper sticker. It sounds kind of cheap or lifeless when you're in the middle of grief or struggles. But I'm just telling you, looking in my rearview mirror, I have seen God do that. In situations where at the moment, maybe I couldn't say that in faith. But I can look back and say, yeah, in faith now I have, I've seen it. And so now I believe it for other things. Head of the body, firstborn through his own resurrection, preeminent over all things as the Savior, as the Deliverer. He who the Son sets free is what? Free indeed. Right, just keeping you engaged. The Sanctifier. Pastor, what's that? You don't talk about that. It's like Jesus is our Sanctifier. And in a physical sense, we hand sanitize. And, you know, you go to the mall, and every store has a hand sanitizer. By the time I've come out of the mall... I have sanitized my hands about a thousand times, give or take, you know. Oh, would you just do that? Sure, but I was across the hall, and I just did it five seconds ago. Uh, You know, still smells like alcohol, and my hands are still wet, you know. Jesus is a sanctifier. And again, we talked about fitness as an outward, external thing. But Jesus is a sanctifier, so he cleans us from the inside out. So don't drink soap if you've ever... I don't think many girls in their past have ever tried to eat or drink soap, but some of the guys maybe when they were kids. I mean, it's either eat mud or eat soap. We've probably eaten things we should not have eaten because, you know, we're tactile learners. Like, oh, what is that like? I wonder. Irish Spring, a little, hmm, it looked green. I thought it was peppermint, you know. God wants to clean the inside, and we can, in a physical sense, do that in the same way. You can go through detox. I'm talking about a spiritual thing where God can cleanse us and restore us. Sanctifying, to sanctify is to set apart, to make holy, to purify. And God will be sanctifying us. The ideology, the theology of sanctification is a journey we're on. When we come to Christ, we ask Him to forgive our sins. That is the beginning and the end of our sanctification in promise. But it's the beginning of our spiritual journey that we work out our salvation with fear and trembling. And one day, I will have to leave this old body behind because... It can only be sanctified so much. My spirit, 100%. My soul, I'm working on. The body, eh. Ashes to ashes, dust to dust. But when we are in the presence of Almighty God, we will have a brand new body. And my knees won't click. And my back won't ache. And my hair will be back. Woo! Some of us are like, I, I, we had one person, a good friend of mine, and he... We used to sing that song, hallelujah, 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 praise ye the Lord. If you guys remember, right? Hallelujah, 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 praise ye the Lord. And then, praise ye the Lord, hallelujah, right? My friend, God bless him, he was a sound guy. He could mix things. 
he couldn't sing his way out of a brown paper bag. And we were in a singing group with Youth for Christ, and we would sing on the bus or wherever we were driving to different places, right? And, and this guy, God bless him, he just, he, at least he knew it, right? Like he didn't say, this is my gift, and we're like, wrap it up and hide it under the tree, you know? No, but so we gave him a new, did you know that there's actually three parts to that song? Yeah, it's hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. We gave him, yeah, and then praise ye the Lord. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Yeah, praise ye. That was his part. He could hit that part, and you know, it really didn't matter totally where he was on the map. It's just like, yeah, and he was a part of us, high five. And, you know, you're part of the gang, the band now. Let's get on the road. Let's take this to, no, let's not. We all have a part, but when we get to heaven, man, we will be completely sanctified completely made new, completely made holy. That's the end of our theology of sanctification. It started when we came to Christ. We work it out, and by the end, when we are with Him, we will be 100%. We won't be trying. We won't be getting there. We won't be almost. We will arrive alive in the presence of Jesus Christ. Woo! It's going to be unbelievable. And that's His promise for us. That's Savior, Deliverer, Sanctifier. Man, I just keep on going. I'll go quickly. The Baptizer, we're talking about not just Jesus didn't force people to get under the water. We believe baptism is believer's baptism. It's your profession publicly of what you've already done with you and the pastor at the altar or the Billy Graham crusade or wherever else you ask Jesus into your heart. The baptism is like I recognize that I am dying with Christ, my old self, and that I am being resurrected with Christ and talk about how we got saved. That's why I love those services, because people are saying, I love Jesus, and I don't care who knows it. But Jesus as the baptizer is also the one who breathed on them the Holy Spirit. He said, go into Jerusalem and wait to receive power from on high. Jesus was the baptizer. You say, oh, well, they all just hang out in a room for a very long time, all sweaty and stinky, and then finally the Holy Spirit came. Yes, but it's because Jesus spoke to them and said, unless I leave, the Comforter cannot come. And then he breathed on him and said, listen, you're going to do the stuff that I've been doing. In fact, greater things will you do in my name. But for that, the Son of Man has to leave so that the Holy Spirit can move in. And so he baptized them in the Holy Spirit long before they spoke in tongues, long before he manifested his presence amongst them. But that's what Jesus did. Sorry, my, my thing slid that Jesus is um, the only Savior, the Deliverer, the Sanctifier, the Baptizer, and the soon-coming King. Now, I think you guys have already read the back of the book, but Jesus says, one day I am coming. In fact, when he left, all the, the disciples were like, man, now it's cool, what? And someone was like, why are you gazing at the heavens? He will return, just like he said. Just the way he left is the way he's coming back. That we will see Jesus Christ come again for his church. And it, it, it talks about the kind of days we're having, like right now, that, that the end is near, we're in the end season where, where um, you know, a loaf of bread is going to cost a day's wages. It does in some countries where, where people will be lovers of themselves and only listening to people who say with their itching ears long to hear that common sense will not be common, right? That there will be wars and rumors of war, there will be pestilence, all kinds of stuff. We believe in the pre-rapture of the church through Jesus Christ. So he's coming again. And so we've got to remember that too because we get... Like, well, yeah, you know, my parents believed Jesus was coming back in the 1960s and 70s. My grandparents believed he was, you know, World War II had to be it, right? That was going to be it. And then there was the arms race, the, the Cold War, the nuclear uh, race and all that stuff. And everyone thought in their generation, well, that's it, Jesus is coming. But in all fairness, I still wonder how bad can it get? How many more generations where things seem to be going sideways until Jesus comes back? I don't know. I wasn't a Y2K guy. I sailed right on through 2000 without, you know, 100 cans of baked beans in my basement. But I continue to trust God. We are going to continue to trust God, even with signs of the times, even with the signs of the end. We're not going to let things uh, cause us to live in fear. We're not going to be living in defeat because we have this God who's giving us everything we need for life and godliness. We don't have to fear. We don't have to get bent out of shape. In fact, when we see the news Instead of getting afraid of the news, we need to pray into the news. We do pray for our brothers and sisters in BC. We do pray for 
the underground church in Afghanistan, the persecuted church around the world. We do pray for, for people everywhere who are, who are living in really cold circumstances without a warm place to be. We pray for those who are hurting. Uh, we can let all that stuff overwhelm us, and I'm here to testify to you, church. I have been one of those people in the middle of the week. Man, what am I doing? Man, what can I do? Man, the world is going to hell in a handbasket. I've realized I'm kind of like David because in the Psalms, I wish, but I've reacted like him in this particular way. In the, in the Psalms, you'll notice he starts out with all of these hard things that are going on in his life. And this is how I knew he had a great prayer life because he starts by saying, you know, God, I've got enemies all around me. Or like, this is not fun. Living in a cave, it's not one of those survival videos on YouTube. It's actually cold and wet and stinky and it, it, rocks are hard to sleep on. I don't like this. I'm having a hard time. And as you read the psalm, he says, but you are almighty God, right? I look for help. Where does my help come from? Man, I am feeling oppressed here. But my help comes from the maker of heaven and earth, almighty God. Psalm 121, just to name one of the many. Every time he starts with human perspective and he ends with God's perspective, every time. Read the psalms, recognize He's, he's got real stuff he's dealing with, and then he puts it the God filter on. And he gets fit, spiritually fit, before he even fights the battle. He did that with the Israelites. You pray, he says, and I will go out before the army. God wants to go out before you this morning. If you're spiritually fit and you're going to count on him to handle whatever's going on in the world around us, whatever's going on in your little world, your little scope, your little list of things you're dealing with, God will go before you in all those things and you'll be more than a conqueror. God, help us realize what we've been granted. Is there anything good in us from our nature to our future? Then we glorify you, Lord. We have good in us, so we recognize by your Holy Spirit. We recognize a glimpse of the wonder and awe and the power that comes from the lover of our souls. Maybe you've done this a little bit. Maybe you've done it a lot. It's my heart for you to see God with a new revelation. Some of you have been saved since you were eight. I was saved at eight. Uh, some of you got saved later in life. I, I don't know. It doesn't matter. Some of you really pressed into church. Some of you kind of not. Some of you were planning on being here, but you couldn't make it. You're forgiven, but we'll see you next Sunday. <laughs> I want you to continue to pursue God with the disciplines of becoming fit in the kingdom, fit in your spirit. Pray. Read the word of God. Worship. I don't care if you can sing or not. Make a joyful noise, but worship God. Press into the things God has for you because you won't have them until you press into them. And when you press into them, you're going to see that you're getting in better shape all the time because God's going to work out His work in you. He's got plans and purposes for you. He wants you to be fit. He wants you to be able to have faith in no matter what circumstance. He wants you to be able to speak truth and light and life into your situation and into your family situation and into your work situation, and into your financial situation. God, you missed a zero this side of the decimal. God, I need... He is a faithful God. He's able. And I don't just mean he's, you know, the one-armed bandit God, or he's not a, a lottery God. You go to him, and you, you follow the spiritual disciplines, and he will do a work in you, and you will be blessed. Because my plans are not to harm you, but to prosper you. That's not a prosperity gospel. I'm talking about any kind of blessing. It's not name it and claim it, money, money, money. It's... It could be financial, it could be health, it could be relationships, it could be whatever. But God wants to make us fit so that our revelation of Him is deeper. I would like to be physically fit for myself. But also, I need to be fit because there's a greater call on me than to just survive. And spiritually, we've got to stop just surviving, church. How long have we been in church to the place where we want to just feel okay? Okay, I'm okay now. Whew, okay, that's, that's not the end of your journey. In fact, if you're just starting to get a bit of joy, just starting to feel a little bit of peace, just starting to see some of the things on your long list of things you want God to do, and he does one or two of them, he doesn't want you to go, okay, good, now I can just coast. Absolutely not. Keep getting fit, keep pressing in, because if God has shown you anything of himself at all, any kind of blessing, any kind of working, I'm telling you what, there's more.
great revelation of who God is. It means there's a greater opportunity for faith, for expectation, for trust, for growth, for peace in our world. For him to do things in our lives that we that we wouldn't even dare to imagine or hope for. He can do those things. And I still believe that. I'm still asking for it no matter what I see in the physical realm. I don't care how fat and ugly I look. I'm going to get fit. <laughs> I want us to go beyond just going to church, just being who we've always been. God has something more for you and for me. And I can't even tell you everything that that is. I just know that there's more out there. And if we don't pursue it, when we stand with him face to face at the end of our sanctification, he's going, I'm so glad you made it here. But you know what? I had this for you. And not shame on you, but, but just, man, my heart was for you to step into so much. So God forgive us for when we uh, settle <laughs> for not uh, embracing everything you have for us, not in a greedy or selfish way, but God, as we submit to you and allow you to do that personal trainer work in our life, Lord, we'll be fit to be yours, but just as important, we'll be fit to see Jesus for who he is. God, we want a deeper revelation of your spirit. We want a deeper revelation of the impact of Jesus Christ on us. Father, to understand you as a heavenly parent, way different than our earthly parents in such a greater capacity. We want to be spiritually fit, God, because you want to do that work in us for all wisdom, for all spiritual understanding. <laughs> Thank you, God, that that's your desire for us. Yeah, we'd like it, but man, how much more? That That's actually your desire for us. Help us step into that today. God, we ask you to be a blessing to us in terms of opening our eyes that we would see who you are, who you want to be in us in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's worship together. This is a new song, but the words are incredibly right in line with what God was saying this morning. I just want to speak the name of Jesus over every heart and every mind. Because I know there is peace within your presence. I speak Jesus. I just want to speak the name of Jesus till every dark addiction starts to break, declaring there is hope and there is freedom. I speak Jesus. Depression, I 
over Jesus over our circumstances right now and we stand in the gap for those right now who need you Lord Jesus God you would your your name will be powerful in their situation that you would bring healing right now God that every stronghold would be cast down that your light would shine in every shadow God, we trust you to burn up those things that don't belong. Burn up those things that don't belong, Jesus, in our lives, in our families' lives, Lord Jesus. We speak Jesus into our circumstances. Hallelujah.
God, I thank you that we can apply even a mustard seed of faith into our circumstances this morning. We can take a mustard seed of faith and we can plant it into our situations. We can plant it into our family members. We can plant it into our work situation. We can apply the blood of Jesus. We can speak the name of Jesus. We can be fit because of what you've given us, the weapons we have, the ability for you to transform us and to transform our situations for your glory. We glorify your name, Lord Jesus. We glorify your name. Hallelujah. To you be all of the praise and glory. We trust you. In Jesus' name, hallelujah. Amen. Amen. God bless you, church. Remember, there's a kids' workshop following service. Have an awesome week. Pray into being fit this week, and as you pursue God, He will reveal Himself to you. God bless you.